And in the spirit, God carried me away to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. God carried me away to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Now, we don't normally go to the book of Revelation on Sunday morning. There's so many other books to choose from. And when we do, it can be a confusing experience because its style requires some interpretation. And passages like the one today with its prophetic vision, its dream of a new Jerusalem gliding down out of heaven can seem as distant and speculative as anything in the Bible. And it can be hard. Hard to see how it has anything to say about our lives and how we live them today. In fact, as I mentioned before, a common interpretation of this passage about the perfect city, the ideal community, gives an otherworldly sheen. It's the story of some distant, perfect world, beyond our grasp, unattainable to us in our mortal form, but perhaps may be available to us after our deaths. And there are plenty of people who read it this way. Some people accept it as truth and wait patiently for a golden heavenly era in another world. Others accept it as the whole of Christianity, which it is not, and then reject both it and the church. But the fact is, there is more to this story in Revelation. And it just requires us to step back for a minute, to take time to think, to take our faith seriously, and spend a moment unlearning. Unlearning what popular culture and certain people believe religion is about. Which is to say that we must examine critically for ourselves the idea, the idea that abstractions about the nature of the universe are the dominant product of faith communities, and that what we read about or talk about at church is meant for other people in other places at other times. Because we know that the church is more concrete than it is abstract. And we know that its teachings and its ministries most definitely are meant for us in this place and in this time. Now, as some of you know, a week ago, I was just getting back from the Festival of Homiletics, which is a gathering of preachers who come together to experience great worship and talk and learn about their favorite part of ministry, namely preaching. Turns out it's not every minister's favorite part of ministry, but if you're at the Festival of Homiletics, it's probably yours. And frankly, it's pretty nerdy stuff when you get into it, so I won't bore you with the details right now, except to say that there was this one thing this one fact among the theologically and culturally diverse group of conferees that we all agreed on. And that had to do with how we interpret the Bible. Now, we don't interpret it the same in all respects. After all, some of us were Congregationalists of various stripes, and we can't agree on much. And then there were the Lutherans and the Presbyterians and the Episcopalians and the Pentecostals and the Methodists among others. And then, of course, there were a diverse group of preachers in other ways, separated in some sense by gender, ethnicity, sexual orientation, style of ministry, and income. But we all agreed on one thing. We all agreed on one thing. And as I mentioned it earlier in the service, in fact, we all agreed that the Bible was written by the oppressed and for the oppressed. 
by the oppressed and for the oppressed. And this one basic truth makes that otherworldly interpretation that we were just talking about, not just in our passage today, but in the Bible in its entirety, it makes a solely metaphysical interpretation impossible. Because if you are poor and oppressed, and this is your book, if you are poor and oppressed like Jesus and his followers, then there is no room in your theology for pie in the sky when you die to steal a line from Woody Guthrie. For that leaves you in a world without hope, a world where you are separated from that universal divine love, which is inexplicably in this case, or in that theology, granted to others, but not to you. So the people who wrote the Bible, and the people who read it in the past, and the people who read it and take it to heart today, this city, to them, Coming down from heaven is real. It's a real thing. It's not real in the sense that it already exists, but it is real in the sense that it is under construction. And that it is meant to be built by us. By people who take their faith seriously. When one thinks of this city as being under construction... And when we take responsibility for its design, we find that this passage in Revelation that previously seemed so confusing isn't really all that opaque after all. In fact, it's quite clear. And it's quite egalitarian on some points. And the first thing we are told in our reading is that there will be no temple in this city. No place like this. Because... Well, for the same reason, as the Quran says, let there be no compulsion in religion. Because there will be no sectarianism. There will be no rivals. And also we are told that the gates will not be shut. There will be no need to exclude. That nothing accursed will be found. That clean water will flow through the middle of the city. That food will grow in abundance all year that there will be no hunger. We are told that everyone will be provided for and that the leaves of the tree of life will be for the healing of the nations. That the leaves of the tree of life will be for the healing of the nations. And yes, that is poetry. That is metaphor. Yes, there are still when we read it and dig down into it, we can find theological points that we can argue over in their specificity if we wish to distract ourselves. But this new Jerusalem, this golden city is a target, a goal, a description of the commonwealth of heaven, and one that is meant for right now. Not for some future time, not for some future life. Those ideas are the mental gymnastics of privilege. Now I'd like to talk about that mountain for a minute in the reading. That great high mountain in our story. In our story, John is taken to that great high mountain, to look out over the construction site, where he gets that beautiful view he describes to us. But you see, the mountain isn't where the action is in the story. The city is not on some windswept peak, but down in the valley with everyone else. Martin Luther King, in his final speech, tells us that he too has been to the mountaintop, but we know, at least for Reverend Dr. King, this is not where he stayed. He got his vision of a better world, and then he went to work. Because he knew, just as we know, just as Jesus and the other prophets of old knew, that the problem with great high mountains is that they, too, are privileged locations, separated from the actual work that we need to do. And our challenge is to come off that mountain. Each of us needs to come off our mountain as well, to do more than observe and worry 
about the problems of this world, but also to act, to re-enter the construction zone of that still imperfect city. Now, this is a hard thing to do. And we've talked about it often here at church, this year and in previous ones. The principalities and powers want us to stay in our places. Many churches and other institutions encourage us to retreat, 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 and retreat again from the stresses and injustices of our lives and from the stresses and injustices in the lives of others. Secular society encourages us to feel constrained by cultural norms and the tyranny of our tasks. And to be honest, this attitude, this distancing of ourselves has been a comfort to many of us in many ways. Even as it holds us back. Even as it holds us back. Because there is a sad kind of assurance in despairing of making a difference. Because then we can tell ourselves that taking care of ourselves is enough. That taking care of ourselves is enough. That recycling is enough. That to be more kind, in the words of Frank Turner, is enough. Or to even do no harm, or at least very little harm as we go about our own business, is an adequate response to the problems of the world. And this attitude is what Bishop Story is talking about when he tells the American church that we, we, have to expose and confront the great disconnect between the kindness, compassion, and caring of most American people and the ruthless way American power is experienced directly and indirectly by the poor of this earth. To the extent that we are on that great high mountain, we need to come down. Because a solution to climate change will not be solved on our hiking trips this summer. The solution to poverty and violence will not be found on our summer vacations. And we know that our somber observations and our outdoor gatherings on Memorial Day weekend do not bring about an end to war. Instead, Instead, we must make personal changes in our behavior, hard personal changes. And we need to make public changes, public changes in policy that will also change our behavior. And we need to bring about cultural changes bit by bit as we change ourselves and advocate for others, not just in the relatively insulated world of social media, but also in the town square where we actually live, at work, at home, at school, among friends and among strangers, setting aside for a while our fear of making enemies because we are building, we are building the commonwealth of heaven. And we wear hard hats in a construction zone for a reason. So can we do this? Is this too much? I think we can. In certain times in human history, it can feel like we are going backwards. That personally we are failing. And that societally we are slipping into reverse. And the times we live in today may feel like that sort of time to many of us. But I'm not sure that's actually the case. There's a saying variously attributed to Theodore Parker and Seth Brooks and Martin Luther King to the effect that the moral arc of the universe is long, but that it bends toward justice. You familiar with this? The moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends toward justice. And when we look at history, that is actually what we see. The negative reactions we experience today are because of the progress we have made in the past. Progress made because people of many different faiths and many different backgrounds looked out from that great high mountain at the glorious golden city and then climbed down to help in its building. I don't know what will happen now, said Dr. King. 
We have some hard days ahead, he said. But it doesn't really matter with me now because I have been to the mountaintop. So, may we hear this Memorial Day weekend resolve to heed our own visions from that great high mountain, our own dreams for a better future and a better world, to work for them, whether we live to see them come to fruition or not, to build on the labor of those who have gone before, to bring the commonwealth a little bit closer. Amen.